It's an honor to me to moderate this panel. Let me, let me introduce the distinguished speakers. Rebecca Arbuckes, Senior Vice President, Global Public Policy, Comcast NBC Universal. Dorothy Atwood, Senior Vice President, Global Public Policy, Walt Disney Company. Jacob Glick, Chief Corporate Affair Officer, Roger Communications. And Pula Bakji, President and General Counsel, Legal and Regulatory, Start India. The next hour and a half, we are going to discuss about content and applications, innovation meet policy and regulation, legacy model versus digital native. Okay. The OTT, the OTTs are not a native species for the digital ecosystem, but is now, but it are now incorporated and going to stay and grow. So we are going to discuss about this interesting, uh, interesting area. And please, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Oh, all right. So I'm going to follow the lead of, I think, the gentleman from Google. And I have no slides, although I have a newspaper that will figure into this and stay seated. So um, really a pleasure to be here. When I was in the government before going into the private sector, I worked at the International Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission. And one of my very great pleasures was being able to meet with regulators from around the world and talk about the same issues that we're all looking at from different perspectives. So it really is a genuine delight to be here. Um, I am going to uh, sort of set the stage on the discussion of over-the-top OTT or OVD, we call them here, and how um, it fits into the legacy system uh, by situating them together because I think you can't talk about or understand over-the-top without viewing it as part of a, a larger um, uh, video set of trends and technology. So I'm going to talk about four things we know and one thing that we don't know, and then turn it over to my panelists. So first, we know that technical advances have fundamentally and irreversibly changed the landscape for video distribution, and that viewers can gorge from the biggest menu ever. So David Carr, um, who the late David Carr, who was so very wonderful, columnist at the New York Times. For those of you who aren't from the US, I encourage you to look him up and see some of his readings. He's an absolute brilliant curmudgeon and a wonderful observer of this industry. He wrote a piece last year where he lamented that a friend had told him that there was a new TV show that he just had to watch. David Carr's reaction was, oh no, not another one. His, he went on to write, the vast wasteland of television has been replaced by an excess of excellence that's fundamentally altering my media diet and threatening to consume my waking life in the process. I am not alone. Something tangible and technical is at work. The addition of new devices has made us the programming masters of our own universes. Time shifting allows not just greater flexibility, but increased consumption, and what a feast. So by the end of this year, there will be 400 original scripted series, which is nearly double the number from just six years ago, and we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of user-generated content on platforms like YouTube and Periscope and others. Second, we know that viewers are taking control. In one sense, by now, this is old hat, everybody knows it, everybody recites it in every speech and every panel like this. But in another, it still is, it feels radical uh, to me. And again, it's the technology, it's cloud DVR, it's the internet, it's um, the new devices that are being developed that basically give us control over what we watch, where we watch it, when we watch it, and on what we watch it. People, there's this great comedian who, who does this whole skit about he's just indignant that he can't watch his, his TV shows on the internet on the airplane. He said, how could this possibly be? And you think it wasn't that long ago that that would be a radical proposition. Now, it's, it's basically retro to set aside a time slot to watch something on video, unless it's sports, a live sports event, or something like the Academy Awards, or the Republican presidential debates. 
so for the next generation, the change is going to be even more profound. If you find me a college dorm room with an actual television in it, I'll find you a student whose parents did the shopping, or, or a boy <laughs> who watches a lot of sports. So there's been a lot of economic analysis on the value of the bundle, um, but uh, with a lot of debate back and forth on whether it's, whether it's good for consumers, bad for consumers, I think what, what we've all seen irrevocably, at least in this country, is a paring down of the bundle. So it still is, I think, to a lot of people a good value proposition, but more and more consumers expect to be able to have greater control over the shape of that bundle. So Dish's Sling TV has one. Sony View is offering a slim bundle. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon sell a bundle, a slim bundle. And those who want to buy individual shows can buy them from Apple. We at Comcast, NBC, Universal are also offering a skinny bundle. There's also an explosion of different ways that we can choose to access the content. We're, we're very proud of a, a platform that we developed that put everything up into the cloud, which allows people to search um, it, close to what it would feel like to search on a, a regular search engine for video content, no matter where it is. Seriously, if anybody is in town here or some other time and wants to come by our office, we'll show you a demo of it if, if you're curious. TiVo, here's my prop. TiVo took out a full page ad in this week's New York Time. Anybody who wants to see it can come up later. They're hitting Apple head to head. TiVo is showing all the different things in their new TiVo Bolt that they can do with their video device that they say Apple cannot with its Apple TV. So just incredible head to head competition and innovation in what devices we can use to look. And Apple, but interestingly, Amazon announced last week that it's no longer going to sell or allow retail partners to sell Apple TV or Google Chromecast on Amazon, which created a bit of a stir. And then Apple's Tim Cook recently announced that the future of TV is apps. And I think most of us would say he's, he's probably right. Three, we know that business models are converging. Um, an industry that 10 years ago had everybody neatly in their place has now just blown up. Is Amazon a retailer or a programmer? Is Apple a manufacturer or a video distributor? Is Comcast a traditional distributor or an over-the-top operator? And this isn't really surprising. It goes back to the point about consumers taking control and the advances of technology. So video companies are experimenting with business models and services to distinguish themselves from, from one another, which blurs the lines between networks, distributors, programmers, and equipment providers, which is exciting, but calls into question some of the traditional regulatory structures. Fourth, we know that with global content, all the global content, the world's getting smaller, but the value of our local communities is in some ways getting, getting bigger. One of the more fascinating aspects to me of all these trends, and it was touched upon earlier, and I know that Dorothy's going to talk about this, is how they speed up and morph the policy discussion that's been going on for so long regarding the value of global versus local programming. A lot of over-the-top distributors want global or at least regional licenses, and that is, that is um, definitely moving in a uniform global distribution. But many countries are working to maintain their cultural identities, especially in the face of increasing globalization, and, the, and for that, the value of local content is critical. All this implicates trade, technology, jobs, economic development, and cultural values. At Comcast and NBC, we create both global and hyper-local programming. Globally, it's obvious we, we do big movies, Jurassic Park, and we distribute them around the world. Local, though, we're committed to local programming. Our NBC Universal um, part of the company has increased investments in 17 Telemundo stations to provide more local coverage for Hispanic Americans, and we produce 7,000 hours of local content each year. We, Comcast, have partnered with local communities to develop a technology platform that allows communities to connect and share very hyper-local content. The community could be a block, it could be a neighborhood, it could be an interest group that is concerned with civil rights or pets or whatever. And then in a fusion of sorts, um, NBC, one of, one of our big programs that's internationally popular is Voice, where people compete 
singing, um, and we produce them locally in different languages in over 50 different countries. The other thing is our X1 remote, which is what we search for programming on. We just uh, released a version of it that is bilingual. So in the US, people who, a lot of his, Hispanic families, Latino families are bilingual and they can go back and forth between Spanish and English as they're giving their commands and searching for their programming. And, and this is something I will give uh, Chairman Wheeler credit for is the emphasis on accessibility, which I think is a very important issue, our, our DVR, our remote rather, allows um, for searches that are, that are helpful for the blind and the visually impaired. One other quick thing on the local versus uh, international content, which was flagged a little bit by the gentleman from Canada, I think, in the last uh, session. There's a current debate in Europe over territorial licensing. Um, I think, I think it's fair to say that a pan-European licensing model is probably more consistent with a broader vision of the digital single market, but the government is recognizing that to finance local films and local film production in a lot of countries that don't necessarily have the language or the, the broader reach, you need to be able to do restrictions on territorial licensing. So I think that's a debate that we're seeing strike a good balance um, uh, in favor of some economic models that allow for local programming to continue. So what don't we know? We don't know anything. Uh, we have no idea what this world is going to look like 10 years from now, even five years from now. The interconnectedness means interconnected risk. In August, in just two days, the U.S. media sector lost more than $50 billion in market cap when Disney announced a, a, a reduced projection of ESPN. So if every major player in the video market has Blame a foot... Blame it on us. I know, no. If you every, had nothing <laughs> going this year at all. <laughs> if every major player in the video market has a foot in every aspect of the business, that means that our, that our futures and our fates are somewhat interconnected. Um, there's also, and I don't know if you've talked about this yet, there's been a big disruption in advertising. So advertising drives a lot of the revenue that, that makes a lot of this programming, obviously. And there's been a real shift towards digital advertising from, from traditional media advertising. In the past five years, um, Google's U.S. advertising revenues grew by $14 billion which was greater than the entire growth of the U.S. TV industry over that same period. Just in perspective, our biggest growth um, was one billion and Disney's had about the same, uh, the same as we did. So one of the challenges is that measurement needs to, the measurement of who's watching what, where and when needs to keep up with the shifting of technology so that the advertising that funds this can capture some of the, some of the trends. So finally, couple of implications for policy. Um, the, the statute that we operate under as a cable operator was passed in 1992. When it was passed, satellite TV was just getting off the ground. Phone companies weren't allowed to provide video programming and the internet was in its infancy. So I would say that one of the, one of the key things I learned when I worked on Wall Street was you pay attention to the trends, you don't get too caught up in little blips. And I would say policymakers need to do the same thing and look and see if the trends are in the right direction to, in order to decide whether or not to intervene. Much of what the FCC says it wants to achieve in video, which is more choices for users, rapid growth of online options, is already happening without regulation. In 1992, cable operators had 98% of the pay TV market when the statute was passed. Today, cable operators have 53%. In 1992, 57% of national programming networks were at least partially owned by an operator. Today, 12% of national programming is vertically integrated. So the caution I would give is don't regulate for regulation's sake. Um, instead, recognize that the market's in extreme flux and that the regulators should not interfere as the old models are modified and new ones develop. Instead, I would say the, the country, our economic development would would be better if we focus instead on modernizing the regulatory approach to fit the modern world. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
And as you can see, I have a bad throat, but I'll make it through. I'll spare you global perspectives because India is a world unto itself. <laughs> Incidentally, we are the largest broadcasters. Star is the leading broadcaster in India. We are present across all genres, excepting news. And we have a footprint that dates back several decades ago. And we have our feet permanently entrenched in that country. India, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity of visiting it, is huge. And even that is an understatement. This is a country of around 30 states, each state being a country unto its own, and yet we managed to avoid a civil war. So having said that, let me just give you a sense of the market that we are into. And let's talk traditional media. So in the entire world, you have around 7,000 language that's spoken by people. In India, at least you have 10% of that language spoken right there and then. So we don't need government regulation to tell us that you need localized content. If you don't come out with localized content, you are out of the market. So all the traditional media platforms that we have cater to local sentiments, and the numbers are just out there. We are either the largest or we are the second largest. We are not the fourth or the fifth largest. We are either one or two. However, do these numbers stack up to the economic value? That's where there's a little bit of a problem. The challenge is, historically, media in India has been free for only last two decades. It's not had a free run right from its inception. So what this effectively meant was that consumer habits were not really aligned to paying for consuming media. So when compared to other industries, we really don't score much. When compared to other countries, it's a bit of an embarrassment. However, if you look at the overall paradigm, we have been doing good if you look at an average KGAR. However, individual segments have had mixed successes as well as failures. What empirically comes through is that in those sectors where you have had regulations, they have been faring badly compared to those that have been completely unregulated. So for example, films and print have been largely unregulated in India, whereas all other segments have been under stringent regulatory conditions. And when I say stringent regulatory conditions, we talk about actual micromanagement of business practices that the government as well as the statutory regulator really prescribes in terms of how we want to make our contracts, how we have to price our channels, how we have to ensure offerings in both bouquet and mandated a la carte, and I'll advert to that after some time. But what this has resulted in primarily is that the overall business health does not really stack up to the numbers that I just showed you. However, we have a new challenge. Television is becoming old economy, and we have the millennials rising. And this is a huge maverick that we are having to ride. And though millennials are defined as the age group between 19 to 34, I have a six-year-old son who is asking for a smartphone in his upcoming birthday. So I really have a challenge with that definition. As more and more kids become habituated to smartphones and new technology, we are going to see this bracket increasing in coming days. However, internet has been a mixed blessing in this country. We have had a literal explosion in terms of number of internet users, but unfortunately the speed maybe needs to catch up a bit, but that hasn't stopped internet consumption, as you'll see. We have moved from 2G to 3G to now 4G, and we have a very vibrant fixed as well as a wireless network that gives 
tremendous amount of variety when it comes to consuming media. This has essentially resulted in us, those who are old economy, those who are traditional players, aligning and marrying into edge. So what we have been witnessing is that traditional broadcasters like Times of India, NDTV, ZTV, Sony, all of them have had to come out with digital offerings. And this is an evolving process with new players coming in who are also focusing more on audio because we have to understand Indian content is intrinsically connected to both music and the audio narrative. We are not those countries where you have specific genres of musicals. All our films happen to be musicals. So, uh, the love for song and music is so deeply entrenched in the Indian psyche that you have a large number of edge providers who fundamentally are rooted into music 24-7, 365, and you have a thriving market of musical edge providers. There has been only one exception who has been really, really big in terms of both video, audio, as well as a composite offering, and that is, of course, YouTube. They have been the first movers in this space. And through lots of ups and downs, they have managed to steal leadership position, position from everybody else. And they are huge, both in terms of revenues as well as in terms of market share. What this has resulted in is you have a plethora of social networking sites and e-commerce media populating the OTT landscape. However, because of this lack of video content that we usually see characterizing Indian markets, we came up with Hotstar, the largest, the biggest digital experience that the world has experienced in. We achieved 10 million users in 40 days, whereas it took our competitors at least seven days to 24 months to even reach a million. So this has been a prolific experience. Hotstar essentially houses our premium and niche content as well as mass content. And we have been trying to deliver value to consumers by making it free at the inception. We do have plans going forward, but as of this stage, we, in we intend that the masses soak it in. So the way it's panning out in India is that traditional and OTT are in a samba. They have been dancing together. And there's a difference because of the regulatory landscape, both in terms of participation and also the monetary prospects. So in India, while you have the traditional platforms selling both content and capacity as one intrinsic whole, in, when it comes to OTT, consumers have to procure it from different vendors. That is unless and until you have distributors having their own in-house OTT applications. However, how the reason this has not resulted in any cord cutting that we see in Western democracies or other jurisdictions is because the cost of traditional media continues to be extremely low vis-a-vis -vis the OTT platforms. The reason is not because the OTT content providers charge consumers, it is simply because the data costs in India are still a little prohibitive. However, that is also fast changing with rapid infrastructure deployment. And we are going to get into a time zone where we will be juxtaposed to a situation where we will have to make some hard choices in terms of pricing content. But our infrastructure development really matching up to the pace of consumption is something a bit of a challenge. As probably you all know, we have a Digital India initiative that we have undertaken. It's the cherished goal of this country to achieve pan-India connectivity in the next couple of years. However, we seem to be falling behind a bit. And the resultant data costs, revenues, and usages have to be aligned. 
and we are having a challenge in that regard as well. What we have experienced is that while data consumption costs are far, far higher than actual traditional platform expenses, but whether they are remunerative enough for operators to come up with a viable infrastructural proposition is a bit of a challenge which the regulator is presently grappling with. So you have myriads of apps consuming different amounts of data, and this has not really gone unnoticed with the regulators. Today, you have three different entities in India looking at the OTT business. You have TRI coming up with a consultation process. You have DOT, the Department of Telecommunication, which has recently released a report. And you have a parliamentary committee sitting on top of both asking questions. So it's a very emergent, nascent field, but the regulatory attention is there. But the problem that we saw before with traditional media is that the numbers do not really pair up with the monetization prospects. The question that is existential for all of us is to see whether internet or whether OTT would be driving the same road as traditional media when it comes to monetizing prospects. And that is where we find a risk. Because historically, in every other country that we go to, it's always the traditional media that has defined the narrative for monetization when it comes to OTT. If that context is not cogent or strong enough, we as businesses have a real fear of whether online is going to be viable or whether it is going to be actually worth it. So while we have a huge potential, we don't really see money coming in anytime soon. We are the third smallest in terms of revenues, whereas, like I said, we may be very big in terms of numbers. But has that stopped transactions? No. You have foreign players as well as domestic players coming up with innovative content in this particular space. You have a stack load of deals that are happening as we speak. You have transfers happening, you have mergers, acquisitions happening on the EOTT space, which is of a scale and phenomena that is unprecedented in the entire world. In the days to come, this is only going to expand. However, there are some key concerns. India has always been traditionally a regulated market. When I say regulated, this means the regulator is going to tell you how much you're going to be pricing your channels, how you'd be doing business, how you'd be actually entering into contracts. They actually have a reference interconnect offer that is mandated, which is a standard contract that has to be entered into with all operators. The unfortunate part of this regulatory distortion is that while the number of operators have increased rapidly, you are in a market where there are 6,000 cable operators, you have six DTH operators, you have two head and in the sky operators, and you have only a handful of broadcasters. And even that space is witnessing a massive exodus. People have been unfortunately leaving this country because of regulatory prescriptions. So unlike China, which says that, well, you can come out here and we'll give you a slow death, India perhaps has a different language to say, okay, understand us far more better, and if you can, maybe you'll be rewarded at the end of the day, but we will listen to you. So it's not that the, it's a shut and end story, the regulator does hear us, and from time to time, it does come up with reforms. The challenge that we essentially face is rooted in history. The TRAI was historically given the task of regulating telecommunications. In fact, the statutory enactment which enabled the formation of TRAI only had telecommunication services in mind and had categorically excluded broadcasting services. However, as an afterthought, by way of an amendment, broadcasting services were also included into telecommunication services. So as a result, what we, have, what we had was engineering geniuses in the government pondering over intellectual property issues. And that's like an elephant riding a camel. 
and that's where we have a challenge. They don't mind listening to you, but then engineering logic always gets the better of IP. And that's the story so far. The question that we fundamentally have is whether internet in India can break the monetization jinx. We believe it can, provided there is a large-scale reform in both traditional as well as the online space, where we don't have a situation where linear regulations are supplanted and carried forward in the online domain. We don't want a situation like that. And I trust the government with the present dispensation that they aren't really going to go, to, go that path. In fact, we have been assured by the regulator that there's a review that is going to be coming up, which will take into its compass the entire state of tariff and contractual regulations that are in place, because they also realize that all the prescriptions that they have had over the years have only resulted in a plethora of litigations with very little value. So that understanding has gradually permeated, and we are up for a review come January. We also have concerns with regard to content protection, like my friend in the panel rightly adumbrated. And we believe that there is a substantial activity going into there as well. We have the APEC standard setting body, the Bureau of Indian Standards, deliberating on standards for set-top boxes. And they have written to us that they would like to know more about content protection features to be inbuilt into set-top boxes. So that's very encouraging. So we believe that going forward, OTT has a future only and only if market dynamics are allowed full play. And in a situation where monetization abilities are not restricted or restrained by any sort of external public pronouncements or a misplaced feeling of what really would be good for Indian consumers. Because actually in a thriving competitive state that we are in, it is our fundamental faith that markets will resolve policies. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies.